Yvonne Seltzer has only been a member of the Minnesota State House of Representatives since January 8th. That is when Yvonne and the other members of the current session took the oath of office. Yvonne represents Minnesota House District 48A, which includes the north half of Eden Prairie and the south half of Minnetonka. We welcome her to Democratic Visions. Thank you, Jeff. I'm glad to be here. Now, Tim O'Brien is traveling today. That's why I'm here. He would remind us that in November, Democrats did very well in Edina, Eden Prairie, and Minnetonka. Now, Minnesota House District 48A, we're half Republican, half Democrat, and a lot of independents in between, of course. What are you hearing when you visit with your constituents? You know, Jeff, I'm hearing the same thing that I heard on the campaign trail, and that is that people want us to concentrate on the important issues of jobs in the economy, education, and the issues that affect our Minnesota quality of life. And they're looking to me to represent them. I'm getting a great deal of input from them, phone calls, emails. I've had a town hall meeting. I've had several coffees. And I'm hearing that they want us to buckle down and get the job done. You have authored uh, House File Number 1, the very first bill introduced this session. That's kind of an honor. And tell us about that bill. It pays back the money that we owe our schools, and that is a pledge that I made during the campaign. Explain what that money is we owe, owe to our schools. Certainly. It, these, the state, unfortunately, has used some accounting shifts and gimmicks to balance its budget because there is a con in the Constitution we are required to balance our budget. So what the state has done is delayed payments to our schools. And it's a little techie to try to explain, but by holding back some of that money, some of our school districts have had to borrow to pay bills and that they've had to pay interest on those bills, and that's money that could have gone into the classroom. So my bill, to make it really short and simple, ends that. Now, does House File Number 1 have bipartisan support? It not only has bipartisan support, but uh, several Republicans have introduced uh, very similar legislation. And when I presented House File Number 1, Republican Assistant Majority Leader uh, Woodard was presenting his similar bills the same day and called it a kumbaya moment. What does he mean by that? Some of us are younger than 40 <laughs> who watch this and may not know what kumbaya means. That means coming together. <laughs> coming together, like around a campfire. There you go. Okay, good. A number of bills over in the legislature are kind of controversial. Legislation having to do with the more effective control of the sale of uh, assault-like weapons. And it seems like both the DFL and the Senate and the House not going in the direction a lot of the polls say they should be going into. What's your take on this? I think that uh, it's regrettable that we haven't seized the moment of Sandy Hook to do a little more, but I understand that people have different ways of looking at this highly emotional issue. Some people really look upon it, Jeff, as being a Second Amendment issue, and a number of my colleagues feel that way, and their uh, constituents are, or the constituents that are contacting them are also expressing that same view. So there's not the support for massive reform um, there in, in the House or the Senate. Amongst our elected officials. Yes. Despite the polls. Yes. The other controversial issue, of course, is um, gay marriage. A lot of your constituents have come to you and said, hey, support this. What's going on there? Will that happen? Do you know, that's a very good question. It passed out of committee in both the Senate and the House, and now it is awaiting our action on the floor. One commitment that both the House and the Senate has made is that we will make sure that we take care of those issues that our constituents told us we have to, take, to deal with. Jobs the economy, balancing the budget, education, health care, the environment, transportation. And they want us to deal with those issues before we step into some of the more emotional issues. So I would anticipate that we will be taking a vote um, later, uh, later this session. Yvonne, you're on the Energy Policy Committee in the House. Yes. Uh, what's going on there? Jeff, I just have a little question for you. I'm wondering yeah. if you know uh, what percentage of our fossil fuels that we use in Minnesota actually come from Minnesota, our natural resources in Minnesota? Uh, I'm aware that we probably use a little bit of peat from northern Minnesota <laughs> for barbecuing and stuff like that, but probably very little. Zero. Zero? We have no fossil fuels okay. here in Minnesota. And, Jeff, we export $20 billion 
every year to buy those fossil fuels which we import and use for energy. Now you know Minnesota has been a lead leader in, in energy. We do have a, a 25, 25 percent of our uh, 25 by 25 standard where 25 percent of our energy needs to come from renewable energy sources by the year 2025. But in the uh, Energy Committee, we have passed a bill which encourages Minnesota and really mandates that Minnesota do even better and that we have 40% of our energy coming from renewable sources by the year 2030. There also is in that bill a mandate for a standard of 4% solar usage by 2030. It's a, it's a modest goal, but Minnesota is not the sunniest place in the United States. However, we do have solar energy here. It is a renewable resource and we feel that it should be in the mix. On your committee, uh are you getting Republican interest in supporting this? Well, I would say that it's probably mainly a majority party effort, though uh, the wind energy um, that we use, I think, has a lot of support by our Republican colleagues. And, uh, and actually, wind, Jeff, is one of the least expensive fuels we use now in Minnesota, right down there with uh, natural gas. Now, the House and Senate sent to Governor Dayton the health exchange bill and he signed it. Yes. Well, I was very excited for uh, the Minnesota health care exchange to pass. First of all, we had a choice. We could let the federal government come in with their pre-made cookie cutter exchange format or we as Minnesotans could design it ourselves and have the ability to tweak it as we move forward. So I'm very happy that we took the initiative to design a health care exchange that is anticipated to save those families who are, who are participating about $500 a year. We expect to see health care premiums go down for those families and we, need to, we expect to see 300,000 Minnesotans who are now not covered, Jeff, by health insurance join the ranks of the insured. But you're aware that we have people in our community and statewide who are saying this is going to be the apocalypse for a lot of small businesses, that it's going to take away uh, the rights for people to choose their doctors, all this sort of stuff. A lot of it is not true. Well, you know, I was a proponent for allowing to have some choice in the exchange. Yeah. There were other proponents who wanted to have less choice. And so the House bill that passed out provided a great deal of choice. And I was very happy about that. And of course, life is compromised. And so the bill that came back still does have a good deal of choice, maybe not as much as um, I would have liked to have seen. But still, when I took a look at it, I'm confident that this will be economically a good move for our state and I think for health care for our citizens it will be a great improvement. And it's not set in stone is it? I mean if things parts of it don't work it can be tweaked a little bit correct? That's the beauty of it. We in Minnesota have designed this health care exchange and so we can tweak it. You were chair of the Hopkins School Board District for uh, two terms and you've met with the public quite a bit. However, you've never had a town meeting as a representative. Well, how did it go? You know, it went very well. I had John Pollard from the Minnesota Office of Management and Budget come out and present what, what at that time was the governor's budget, which as we've known that since then, he's revised that budget. You know, they're, they're trying to move forward. People were very interested in hearing what proposals the governors had, and they were giving me a lot of input, and I'm hearing that what people want is a sensible solution to the chronic deficits that we've experienced eight out of the last 10 years in Minnesota. They want a combination of increased revenue and efficiencies, which will result in cuts. They want a balanced budget. They want us to do it in a fiscally responsible way. Aside from the, the budget question, what else are people bringing to you? Education. Education is huge and that's what's made our state great. And businesses come here not for our fabulous climate but because of our highly educated workforce. And we have got a fabulous education system. We have the highest ACT scores in the nation. However, we also have one of the worst achievement gaps. And people and businesses in particular are very concerned about that. They're concerned about our future workforce. So I'm hearing a lot about the necessity of not just making the same old give more money to education, but making those strategic smart investments that are proven to produce results. 
at the town hall meeting and your coffees. Are only Democrats showing up? No, I have had Republicans come also and independents a lot because I had a lot of independents and Republicans um, vote for me. And at one of my coffees, it was very interesting. Um, some of the officers from the Republican Party, Senate District 48, came and I welcomed them. And by the end of the meeting, one of the officers looked at me and said, Yvonne, you're a very good facilitator. And you know, that was a brief shining moment. And I'm hoping that as we move forward, we can build upon that because the other thing that my constituents are telling me, Jeff, and I think that people, elected officials have heard across the state is that we need to work together. The Democrats do control the House right now, but your colleagues, uh, Jennifer Loon and some of the other uh, Republican legislators from our area, obviously have much in common with you. What's it like working with them? I have to tell you, they've been very cooperative. Obviously, there's some differences yeah. of opinion, but um, for example, Representative Loon and I carried a bill that will assist our schools in our, our area. And I've had other Republican legislators sign on to various bills with me as I've signed on to their bills. So, you know, Jeff, sometimes when people tune in, they tune in um, and see maybe what looks like acrimonious uh, debate on the House floor. And, you know, there are differences, but a lot of that is theater, too. And, uh, you know, it's not newsworthy, I suppose, to say that 95% of the time we're working together. Now, Ron Earhart is now a Democrat, a colleague of yours in the House. Paul Rosenthal, also from Edina, represents West Bloomington and part of Eden Prairie. You're working with them, too, as well as John Benson, Steve Simon, and Hopkins. Um, you're not alone, are you? No, I'm not alone. And a wonderful uh, thing for me is that Ron Earhart is chair of the Transportation Policy Committee, which I serve on. And it is amazing to learn from someone who has spent decades in the state legislature. And Ron is not only a very astute chair, he has a vision for transportation in our state, and he is very kind and helpful to the rookies in the room. Like you. I'm a rookie in the room. <laughs> Light rail transit along the Southwest Corridor is coming to Eden Prairie, going through Minnetonka and Hopkins and Minneapolis and St. Louis Park. There are still some controversial issues regarding routing through Eden Prairie at this point and some in Minneapolis as well. What role does the legislature have now in this? Can you weigh in on where the route goes or are you just the money people? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't say just the money people, but the funding is very important. Yeah. And I'm co-author on several bills that would uh, direct the state of Minnesota to bond to assist in the actual construction of the Southwest Light Rail. We know that we still need to come up with about another $118 million for the construction of the light rail. And I would prefer to see uh, the state bond to pay, pay that portion. That money is needed to make federal grants kick in. Exactly, and the federal government will pay for half of the construction of our Southwest Light Rail. And as we all know, Minnesota, Jeff, is a net exporter of taxes to the federal government, so it would be nice to get some of that back. What if um, we have problems locally raising that money to kick in for LRT in the Southwest? Well, you know what? I think the state needs to kick in. That it's just 10% of the total cost okay. of the Southwest Light Rail. Only 10%. That's and not, and yeah. uh, I, I, you know the the local the locality will be kicking in, and the state I feel needs to pay its fair share. And I was sent off to St. Paul with a directive from many of my constituents to make the state pay their fair share, and so we're working on that. Yvonne Seltzer, my representative. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's yeah. been a pleasure. Democratic Vision segments can be seen on our YouTube channel and the DFL48.org website. Democratic Visions is handmade by volunteers through DFL Senate District 48, Eden Prairie and Minnetonka. Lori Pryor, Chair. <laughs>